Hello, everyone. We have a couple people connecting to the audio. Um, it looks like it's going to be a really small, intimate group today, um, which is good. <laughs> um, so we'll just give it a couple more minutes or just a little longer, and then we'll go ahead and get started. While we're waiting, um, if you want to share your name and affiliation in the chat box, maybe tell us where you're coming from, that would be great. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, Shay. Awesome. Let's go ahead and get this party started. So I'll start. Thank you all for coming to our science communication workshop called Pitch It. Um, my name is Jesse Rivera. I am the Society's Program Coordinator here at Ecological Society. Um, I'm a underling to Jessica, who will introduce herself right now. Go ahead, Jessica. I would say you're an underling, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're equal. We're equally dedicated to this SIP webinar series. Hey, everyone. I'm Jessica Johnston. I'm uh, Education Programs Coordinator, also at ESA, and um, I I am lucky enough to be the administrative partner for the Scientists and Parks Fellows program. So I know that it's like a little subset of the larger SIP program. Um, but we're also doing this cool engagement piece webinar series. So happy you're here. Happy to get to know you. Awesome. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping rules for today. So this is an informal workshop with our ESA Director of Society Programs, Adrian, who I will introduce in a second. Um, this is really about participation. So if you want to join in the conversation, um, please do so. We highly encourage it. But we just ask that you uh, raise your hand before you do so you're not cutting anybody off. Um, and then also, please keep your mic muted just in case there's any background noise. Um, you're welcome to post comments or questions in the chat box at any time. Um, in fact, we encourage you to do so. Um, and also, as a final reminder, we will be recording this event. So if you don't want to be on camera, don't feel like you have to turn on your camera. Um, all right. And then real quickly, our next webinar is going to be on financial literacy. Um, this event will be, we're having, um, the host, the host will be from a student success center, and she's going to go over um, saving structures, types of checking and savings accounts, student loan repayment options, um, how to prevent student loan default, all of these really important financial things. So if that's something that interests you and you think that you would benefit from it, we highly encourage you to come to our next uh, event, which will be on March 15th. Awesome, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adrian Sponberg. If you wanna go ahead and give a little background and introduce yourself to the group, Adrian. Sure, hi everyone, um, I'm Adrian Sponberg. Uh, as Jesse mentioned, I am Director of Society Programs at the Ecological Society of America. I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Uh, and yeah, let's see, I'm just going to start from the beginning here because you're probably wondering why there's a space shuttle on a slide for the Ecological Society of America. And the reason for that is um, I'm actually a Alabama native. I grew up in Rocket City, uh, Huntsville, Alabama. And while I was in college to pay my bills, I worked at space camp. And that's really where I kind of got hooked on science communication. Um, and looking at your registration forms, it seemed like all of you were interested in speaking with the general public. Um, boy, lots of black boxes here. Um, I know people have probably got bad connections if you're out of the parks. Um, it's throwing me off talking to boxes because I'm used to talking to like faces. Um, thank you, Madison. Um, so yeah, so I just, um, I wanted to bring up the space camp experience just because, you know, talking to the public, 
that is a whole different beast. And I imagine working at the National Park Service, um, you probably are running into a lot of very diverse um, range of people in terms of their scientific literacy. So, you know, when I was talking with Jesse about this webinar earlier today, and I was like, oh, you know, I need to bring up Space Camp because, you know, with the general public, it's not like you're going in to, you know, say you're going on a hill visit and you know you're going to meet with some policymaker. So you have a, a general idea of, you know, what, what their interest is in, you know, what their level of education on the issue is going to be. But, you know, when you're standing on a museum floor or you're out sampling at a park service um, at a national park and, you know, someone walks up to you, you have no idea what their background is. Um, so that's a completely different kind of science communication. In my book, it's a lot harder. You have to really be um, prepared for anything. And that kind of gets to um, one of, well, I would say actually probably the biggest um, you know, thing to remember with science communication is you really have to listen. And in your case, if you're um, got all these different people coming up, that's going to be easy to listen because you need to establish kind of where they're coming from. Um, but it's a mistake that people do tend to make in terms of like, oh, I'm going to go talk to the media or a policymaker without realizing that there's nuance to each of these um, kind of groups. So, um, boy, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything in the chat or um, if anybody's willing to um, just say a little bit about why you're interested in science communication, what kind of, what kind of, I'm curious before we launch into the more interactive part, kind of what are your, what have your science communication challenges been uh, working at the National Park Service? Anyone? Or even maybe successes, maybe not challenges. I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand, but I have no clue. Oh, <laughs> you can just speak up. Uh, We're a small group. <laughs> it's been a second since I've been on Zoom. I've been teensing mostly. Um, I was going to say I work as a SIP at Scion in the human dimensions physics management realm. So mm -hmm. for me, I think I'm interested in this because I'm often working with uh, contentious issues and working with a very large audience that is very, has strong opinions for how land agencies should be managing access. And typically I'm acting against people's preferred uh, <laughs> outcomes. So finding a way to work with the public to understand the motivations for managed access or for busy use management protocols. Perfect. Yeah, I imagine that that can be that can be tough. Um, one of my so I did the space camp thing, went on did the PhD and then um, did a PhD in ecology at Notre Dame in aquatic ecology. Um, but still was super interested in, you know, making science matter. And so I did a congressional fellowship and I went to the Senate. And so in terms of like the contentious stuff and trying to, you know, uh, work across the aisle, which was something that actually could happen in the year 2000, not so much anymore. Um, but yeah, that, that really is, is challenging. Um, let's see, Shay is typing in the chat. Uh, oops, my chat box is so little. Hang on, I can't see it. Um, oh, an important ecological species that's highly misunderstood and disliked. Okay, so I need to know more about this species. Um, Shay, do you care to elaborate? Oh, prairie dogs. How can someone not like prairie dogs? They're so cute. I know, I know, land management. <laughs> They're cute until they tear up your lawn, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It reminds me of um, 
some of the stuff with the wolves, right? It's like everyone else loves them, you know, I, we, we can have kind of a, a NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard attitude towards um, charismatic megafauna for sure. Um, let's see. Okay. And then Anna, distribute information to coworkers within NPS. Hmm. Okay. That I, I'm, I worked at NASA and at NOAA and I understand enough about the federal government to know that they, each agency is its own beast. So that might be something hopefully some others down here might have some suggestions on. Uh, monitoring network for the region. So, okay, yes, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like you guys have a, a pretty wide range here of communication challenges from even just internal communications, trying to um, have conversations around contentious issues. Um, so what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a little conversation, Jesse, if you wanna pull up the, the slides again, um, about effective communication. And, you know, I, I will start off with a disclaimer here that I generally am not a fan of most science communication workshops. And I say this as someone who's led many of them over my career. And the reason for that is because I think, especially with academics, there tends to be this like, oh, okay, I, I, I sat there, I listened, I learned, you know, done. Um, communication is something you're never done perfecting. Um, you know, I work a lot with uh, Randy Olson, who is a, uh, he was a tenured professor in marine biology, got fed up with the status of the environment and that, you know, academics were just talking to each other. And he went off to film school and, you know, he's written a bunch of books. And one thing he says is, you know, and he, he also quit running these kinds of workshops. He's like, you know, they think they're done and really communication, it's, it's like a muscle, you know, it's a skill, it's something you have to exercise, you have to build up strength, you have to keep your strength. Um, and, you know, my other frustration with these workshops is too often, they just sit here and tell you what not to do, you know, don't be preachy, you know, don't use jargon, you know, don't, you know, be confusing, blah, 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 blah. Um, so for me, I think, you know, given the amount of time that we have and that I want to have this be a little interactive, you know, we want to really want to focus on two aspects of effective communication. And in particular, this kind of crossroads of content and structure. Um, uh, Jesse, if you can hit the next slide. And, you know, picking up on this idea of, you know, a lot of these workshops tell you what not to do, um, but then that doesn't help you get the words you know, on the paper or straight in your head and you wind up kind of, you know, mumbling a little bit and, you know, kind of like, you know, typing as you talk, right, in your head. Um, there's a simple tool that I wanted to share with you all. I'm sure you've all heard about elevator pitches and, you know, having your, you know, 20 second pitch or, you know, a slightly longer pitch. Um, but then they don't tell you how to structure it. They just tell you to have one and that should contain these various things. Um, but arranging those various things is important. And um, sorry, this is animated. If you could hit out the uh, on the slide, Jesse. So this is um, I mentioned Randy Olson before, and he um, created this framework, and it's called the ABT or the And But Therefore. And Jesse, if you can hit the next one, and. I'm sure all of you have studied at some point, high school or college, you know, the three act plays, you know, it's all about agreement, contradiction and resolution. And when we do a longer kind of workshop about around this, uh, there's this great slide that they have um, that's uh, MRI or MRI or CT of people that are watching different films. And the MRI or CT, the imaging of the person that's watching just, you know, random people walking through a park, there's no story. There's, you know, nothing in particular going on. You know, the areas that are lit up in the brain are kind of all over the place. 
But then they also did a scan of somebody who was watching a Hitchcock film that had a clear story. And there were very strong signals in very concentrated areas of the brain. So, you know, one thing in these longer workshops we talk about is that there really is a neurological basis for using narrative structure. So having a structure that we are wired to tune into to how you're communicating with people. And when Randy has looked through this and other people have done the same thing is, you know, it basically boils down to this and, but, therefore. Um, and you can structure your, you know, 20 second elevator pitch can be basically, a, you know, two or three sentences. So let's see, I love the environment and I want the environment to persist. Um, and so I studied science, but I realized that academics were just talking to each other and the public didn't have access to that information. Therefore, I left academia and started working with science organizations to train scientists how to better communicate. So, you know, that was really off the cuff, but you could see how a little bit of finesse would make that better. And so that's actually what we're going to do real quick. Um, let's see, let me see if I missed anything. Okay. Um, so how, how, how chatty are y'all feeling? So we have, how many of us in here? We have 13 total. Um, we could do this as a group or we could break into two groups. But what I wanted to do is give y'all about five minutes to kind of do what I just did off the top of my head um, and try to come up with an ABT, an and but therefore structure of whatever it is the most important thing you want to communicate. Um, so what do we think? Uh, whoever speaks up first wins. Break out or stay together? Uh, together? Okay. Sounds like a plan. All right. So um, let me see. I'm going to go back to the chat. Um, let's see, Catherine is doing dinosaur. Okay. Oh boy. Yeah. Does, um, that is definitely a challenge. Uh, dealing with the anti-evolution, like it's all a lie. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, the level of disinformation and the number of skeptics that you all have to deal with is like exponentially higher than like the, you know, the worst I had to deal with at space camp, for example, was, you know, people were like, oh, the, the moon landing was staged and, you know, like they were definitely in the minority and, you know, you're like pointing to like that that's a moon rock and they're like, ah, you know, but, you know, the, the consequences to society of people not believing we landed on the moon were, you know, much smaller than the consequences of people, you know, not believing in evolution or not believing in vaccines. Um, is there anyone else on the call that has kind of this issue that Catherine mentioned, where people are coming in with, you know, just kind of basically not just disagreeing with you, but not believing that your point's valid? Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, social science. Not a real science. Ugh. That's my biggest frustration. Um, and actually that's, I usually mention that at the end of this talk. As someone who's preaching about structure, I realize I'm breaking my rules right now, but um, I'm doing so in the name of engagement. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves with science communication workshops is they're often taught solely by scientists that are from that field, like so marine biologists or people that have not even looked into the literature. Um, you know, and there is a whole science of science communication. There are people who study this, they can tell you what you're doing wrong and 
my goodness, we do a horrible job of communicating that. Um, okay, so with that, I was looking, I got distracted. I was looking for someone to ask to do a, uh, an AVT. So I am going to ask Madison to give us a quick ABT about your work. I was just trying to write one. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so I was, I'm not gonna like say it in full. I'm just gonna give like what the framework would be. Sure. Um, because because I don't have like a good off the cuff speaking. But um, I think my like agreement or and would be talking about the dual mandate mission of Park Service. So like protection, but also visitor experience. Mm -hmm. that can kind of start to tie into my contradiction which would be like stating like since the marked increase of visitor use uh, from the centennial celebration in 2016 the park has been experiencing a decrease in experience through crowding um, all the other variables there and then like use resolution being um, using visitor use management and potential managed access approaches we can return to like Park Service mission to promote dual mandate. Perfect, I like it. So your your ands were that there's been a success in getting more visitors in, correct? Um, and that and the but is that comes with a price <laughs> to the system itself, and this. It's interesting because I see what you're saying, like the dual use mandate itself is kind of like a but. Um, is that right? Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the classic loving our parks to death memo. Right. Right. Oh, okay. Awesome. No, I think that's good. Okay. Shay has one. Um, would you like Hello, to share? Hello, can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Great. Hi. Um. I'm Shay. Uh, just a okay. little background before I start. I have a little bit of experience with interpretive work, and I have never come across this ABT framework before, but I think I'm going to give it a shot. So this is just off the cuff. Um, so I guess the agreement would be that uh, in the park I'm working at, uh, our goal is to try to protect and um, the prairie dog populations that live in our park but the contradiction there is that these prairie dogs are sort of going through an overpopulation phase right now and they are somewhat interfering with the archaeological resources in our park and so the resolution there is that my project will be to collect more information on where the, park, the dogs are the prairie dogs are in the park so that we can then hopefully see if we can both manage them and also ensure that they continue to have a habitat here at the park Perfect. That's my just off the cuff shot, just shot at it. <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. I like it. I think it, um, yeah, that, that is, you know, you've got, it's similar to what Madison was saying. It's like, you know, we have this success, but it's kind of a problem. Like you've got kind of conflicting missions going there. Exactly. And you it's know. a complicated thing to sort of grapple with in addition to the just like uh, attitudes toward prairie dogs by like general people here. Right, right. Oh goodness. No, no thank you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, we're we're gonna come back to these ABTs. So hopefully you're um you're still writing them down. Um uh, let's see. Does anyone else have an ABT? Sorry, there's a lot moving in the chat. Um, I wrote one for an interpreting climate change course I was in recently and I never got oh. feedback on it, so I wouldn't mind saying that. Perfect. Okay, so I'm at Olympic and the ABT I wrote about was about glaciers and Hurricane Ridge. So just a brief, Hurricane Ridge is a popular accessible viewpoint of the Olympic Mountains. From here on a clear day, you can see Mount Olympus, which includes the famous Blue Glacier. And glaciers are important for many of Earth's processes and plants and animals, such as here in Washington being salmon. But Blue Glacier, just like many glaciers around the world, is melting too fast compared to the amount of snowpack and new ice accumulation. Therefore, Hurricane Ridge offers an important educational opportunity viewpoint for numerous people's backgrounds and abilities to see glaciers and snow. Nice. 
Um, so you're, you've laid out kind of the, you know, what the, oh boy, see, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to get deeper into the, the ABT with the hero's journey in the normal world versus, you know, you go into this, uh, this extra special place and then come back out, you know, elevated. Um, and in your case, the ordinary world, I, I'm wondering what would the return to normal be? Like, what's the conclusion? It, it seems like if I'm understanding, you're saying this is a, a great place, but it's threatened. Therefore, we need to see it now. What's that? Yeah, I think so. I was trying to wrap my head around the whole concept, and I'm, I'm still practicing and figuring it out. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you got the elements there. Um, so just, uh, we did a course, Jesse helped me run a course this spring where we, it was like a whole course on the ABT and it's so hard to write these. And, you know, again, going back to that exercise, like something that Randy would do, he has these story circles. Like if you sign up for one of his courses and people that have taken the course from the past few years will go in there and like just you know have little zoom setups and they'll go through their abts and like workshop it and you know it's kind of like okay what's the problem what's the solution where's the contradiction where's the agreement you know what's your angle um so yeah i think um that's why i'm trying to uh think with with that one it is kind of like the solution is it seems like it's see it before it's gone, which, um, yeah, I don't know. Jesse, do you have any, any feedback? I'm just, I'm not picking on you, Jill. I'm just, I, you wanted more feedback. So I'm trying to. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I mean, if you have ideas on how it could be strengthened, I would love to hear them, but I was trying to steer away from concepts of, um, you know, like recycling and don't use straws and whatnot, because in the grand scheme of things, that's yeah. not helping the glaciers stop melt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was going to say with uh, ABTs and starting them, it's always good to um, make it as simple as possible. So like prairie dogs, like prairie dogs are extremely beneficial, but people don't like them. Therefore, we have to make people like them. And then you can fill out from there that really simplistic form and start building out that way your narrative. So you get the basis of it and then move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so simplifying more. I like it a lot more. Um, <laughs> I have an idea. So I, I study glaciers and right, I'm not from Alaska, but I'm working at a park in Alaska right now. Um, and so obviously I've talked to a lot of people about glaciers um, and I found it really interesting coming to Alaska where people here like live among glaciers and being from the lower 48, it's like really unusual to actually get to see one. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, I think people think about them differently up here, whether or not people believe that glacier recession has to do with climate change or not. Like, that's not a question that glaciers are receding up here. It's just a question of why. So it's kind of a different story. Um, but I think that this is in Washington, right? So I don't know, maybe part of the therefore or the, the purposes and importance of this ridge with the view is like simply getting people the opportunity to like physically see and experience a glacier mm -hmm. when they probably haven't before. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at, but I can definitely simplify to make it much more clear. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, I, I, I see that. And I, I think part of it is I'm so, it's that whole bias. I'm so used to hearing like, oh, something's disappearing. Therefore, we need to do this. <laughs> so I was like trying to wrap my head around like, oh, yeah, it's disappearing. So go see it. And it's good that <laughs> you still have to see why you can. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, let's see. I had an ABT that I wanted to try out. Um, Excellent. And I'm also still very new to this, so I, yeah, let me know if this actually works. So okay. um, I work at Point Reyes as a SIP, and um, I work at a beach where there's elephant seals. And um, so the ABT is Drake's Beach is a highly visited beach in Point Reyes, but elephant seals are starting to expand into Drake's Beach. 
causing conflict with keeping the beach open to visitation, but also respecting the elephant seal's space. Therefore, and I, I guess this is where I'm kind of confused. Would it be like a statement of action or would it be like a question? Yeah, I think it's usually a, a statement of action. Okay. So, you know. So I guess, yeah. So my therefore would be it, it is important to pr prioritize elephant seal habitat over visit, visitor experience. <laughs> But that's okay. kind of the controversy in that situation. Right, right. Um, so maybe, can you read your, your butt again? Uh, the butt is, but elephant seals are starting to encroach onto Drake's Beach um, public area. So I'm just going off the cuff here. So it seemed like both your and and your butt were focused on, you know, people really like this beach, but oh no, the elephant seals are coming. Therefore, mm -hmm. we need to kick the people off. So if the focus was initially on people, yeah. but now your solution is to is centered on the elephant seals. Mm -hmm. So I would maybe focus on the elephant seals. Like okay. have they, been, I'm gonna sound really ignorant here, but like, mm -hmm. have they been threatened? Is this a good thing that they're, um that their range is expanding their populations are increasing you know is it you know is it climate change is moving their range you know so those could be your ands and say but you know point Reyes is a popular destination for tourists therefore we need to look into management strategies which mm. prioritize the need of the seals does that make perfect. sense yeah that's perfect yeah. thank you yeah mm -hmm. great um, anyone else before we move on to the next exercise? No, oh, this is fun. I feel like I'm learning things. Um, okay, um, Jesse, could you pull up the slide with the dog, please? I think we need to bring him up next. Um, so I'm again, I'm going out of order here just based on the, the chat and things I'm learning about you all. Um, this is actually a picture from the March for Science that happened, oh gosh, many years pre-pandemic. And this is a, um, a picture I like to use in the talks I've given about science communication. And, you know, and it follows, you know, 10 minutes of talking about social science and what they found out about, you know, the more like, you know, there's for a long time there was this completely bogus hypothesis put forward by not social scientists that, oh, it's because people are scientifically illiterate. If they just knew more science, then they would agree. And, you know, this whole cultural cognition group like did studies and they're like, nope, it's actually worse. Like the more scientifically literate people are, the more divergent they get because they're smart enough to go find the evidence that, you know, backs up their opinion. So, you know, if you go into a contentious topic and, you know, armed with data as if this is somehow going to slay the enemy, you know, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Actually, you're probably going to make things 10 times worse. Um, and part of why I like this image is it kind of brings things down to a point you know, a little away from whatever it is, um, you know, the HPV vaccine was the big one that was contentious at the time. Um, obviously now it would be COVID vaccines, but, you know, there was so much contention over this HPV vaccine and they were, you know, failing with the marketing and the messaging. And I saw this image and I thought, this is why, why don't we just go back to basics, get them to agree at some level on a vaccine that's a good thing. Um, and I think anyone who's ever seen Old Yeller would agree that the rabies vaccine is a good thing. Um, so trying to bring the conversation, you know, down from, you know, DEF CON 11, where, you know, uh, that, what is that movie, Inside Out, where anger is like the flames are shooting out of his head, you know, so bring it back from that to a point of agreement and work your way up to the part where people are banging their heads. Um, so that's just you know, that's going to vary. And, you know, honestly, again, going back to communications and exercise, this is something that's very contextual. So, 
you know, in a one hour workshop or even a semester long workshop, you know, I, that's not a solution that, you know, is going to just pop into your head. It's going to take time interacting with people, listening to them and, you know, listening, not just, you know, thinking how wrong they are, but seeking, listening, seeking to understand what is their, what is their, you know, motivation? What is, what is the point, the real point of conflict? Is there some kind of, you know, common ground where we can start a conversation and where we may be able to make inroads? Um, and a good example of this, again, this is from a while ago, back uh, before climate change was covered nearly as heavily as it is now. And there was a story about a student at a Texas university who had just never believed in climate change, you know, was just completely against any conversation about it. And the turning point for that student, and the student, by the way, had like a huge love of cars, like racing and dirt bikes. And, you know, he had always felt personally attacked. And it wasn't until he was in a college course and the university professor started talking about methane emissions from cows as a contributor to climate change and the blame was shifted from his, you know, his beloved hobby to something else that, you know, he was able to approach the issue with a more open mind. Um, so, you know, that's, that's another thing to keep in mind, like what, you know, when you can take the blame or, you know, focus the conversation in a way where people don't feel personally attacked um, and finding and inroads and starting the conversation, then you can start to work towards solutions. Because um, the reality is, I mean, there's always going to be a conflict when it comes to humans and the environment. No matter where you're at, which national park you're at, what you're studying, there's going to be some kind of human, you know, wildlife, you know, environment conflict. And so, you know, we have to find ways to have these conversations in a productive way. Um, so with that in mind, what I wanted to do next was to talk a little bit about our audiences. Um, and part of this, you know, following up on this, people respond more um, to passion than to data. And they also, um, another tool that you all can use in terms of connecting with your audience is this whole idea of wonder. Um, that's something that, you know, you'll have at the national parks and spades, you know, what is it that, how can you connect with people? Just have a conversation, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to like get in there with our, you know, with our 90 second elevator pitch and get right to the, you know, high stakes before we build a relationship, even if it's a five minute relationship with these guests or the people that, you know, the or it'd be a lot longer than a five minute relationship with adjacent landowners, right? Um, so building that relationship and building trust is important to having these conversations. Um, so that would be if we were to go into breakout groups um, or maybe I'll give people a few minutes, um, you know, maybe jot down a list of who your audiences are and this is something that we do in a, um, a course, again, a different course that Jesse and I ran this spring on um, sustaining biological infrastructure. It's a course for scientists who've found themselves leading large projects. And the whole idea is like, you need to understand who your stakeholders are and what's motivating them. And so I think maybe if we can just take two minutes and write down a list of who your potential audiences are, you know, maybe, or even just pick two or three and they can be pretty specific. So general public is not, that's not a good one for the purposes of this exercise. And then think about, you know, in terms of what we we're just talking about in terms of values and points of common interest, how, would you find a good starting point? Like what's an example of something safe where you can start to get to the harder conversation? So Jesse, can you, do you have a timer for like, let's do three minutes.
All right, that's three minutes. All right, people with cameras seem to still be working. Is anybody, has anybody come up with a particular audience and common thread that you'd like to share with the group? I'll, I'll say something just because uh, sure. I've never done this before. And while you all are my obvious audience, I have another audience that I deal with, which is uh, science educators and under, uh, particularly undergraduate faculty. I work a lot with them. And um, in thinking about in terms of commonality, I found this quite interesting because their commonality is their love for science, right? They're science educators. They're usually PhD holding uh, faculty members. So clearly they have a passion for science, but uh, not necessarily a love for education or teaching, um, which is interesting because when I'm trying to convey the importance of building an education framework, I'm always coming from the angle that they care <laughs> about yeah. teaching and not necessarily about science. And a lot of them do genuinely care about teaching, but you know, for the most part, they're in it because they love science. Uh, and so that just made me rethink kind of my strategy when I'm talking to science educators, so. That's, that's a good one. And yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, I think we all do that and it's human nature. It's like, you know, someone's got a label on them or, you know, they're a fisherman or whatever. And so you're like, oh, they, you know, they're out there to make money off the fish. And, you know, you think that's their motivation and, you know, they're, what's really driving them might be something completely different. Um, that's awesome. Um, let's see, Anna dropped in the chat talking with ranchers. Yep. Loving the area where you're at and wanting it to stay beautiful and livable for future generations. I think that's, I think that's really important as common ground. I think sometimes we get so caught up in, you know, red versus blue, you know, especially when we're talking about anything ecology and you're out in the rural areas where honestly, everybody loves the same thing, right? It's like you want you want the system to survive. Um, you know, so full disclosure, my PhD research was funded largely through Ducks Unlimited. And, you know, I was studying waterfowl and, you know, looking at conservation of um, wintering, overwintering habitat. And, you know, I've, I've, I've had a few tense arguments <laughs> or conversations maybe with fellow ecologists who think anybody who hunts is horrible. And I'm like, if you like wetlands, you should be thankful that there are hunters because they would not exist if it weren't for the ducks and the duck hunters. Like, you know, so I think there's, you know, that's another group that I think people tend to think are like, oh my God, so different, like hunters and ecologists, but there is that common, you know, love for the environment and, you know, starting that and sharing that and trying to work from there. Um, let's see, there's another one in the chat, uh, Madison, coming to like sustainable tourism. Okay. Uh, Madison, did you want to talk further about that? I don't have a whole lot more to say other than it's uh, one of our more challenging stakeholders because I do feel like they have a very invested impact. Stakeholders for Zion is really hard because it's like, we have our international audience, we have local audience, we have Utah politics, which are a whole other uh, can in and of itself. So focusing just on like the locale of Springdale and business owners who generally have arms to say about actions because they think it is restricting their business and their growth models as uh, capitalist like functioning systems. And so um, instead trying to focus on sustainability of those markets and um, longevity of the area and people's positive experiences because if they're focusing on a business growth model they don't want to see it capped but if it has that cap it could lead to future growth over time it's kind of like right. the penny thing where like do you want one penny today or like four t four and ten years <laughs> or whatever that is you know right right yeah 
Yeah, and that, it's always hard when, you know, you're at the same point right now and you're both envisioning kind of worst case scenario 10 years from now if you go whichever way the other person wants to go. It like, it, it, it can set you up for conflict for sure. Um, so, okay, so then the point of convergence there would be having a positive visitor experience. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see, we've got about 10 minutes left. Does anybody else have an audience that they want to share? I could go. Great. <clears throat> um, I, I mostly just do like straight scientific research, so I don't get to talk to the public very much. So usually I'm talking to, I don't know, other scientists at conferences or something or family or friends mm -hmm. or like giving a science lecture talk to the public. So people that are already sort of engaged or concerned and, you know, with glaciers, it's like really easy to go over that edge of like, oh my God, everything's melting, the world is doomed. Um, so, so my challenge usually is like, reeling that back in um and i don't know i don't have a good solution for this but i think just kind of like getting a little bit more specific about what we know and what we don't know you know it's not as just like simple as that of course so like actually getting a little more detailed and scientific about it i think sometimes helps or talking about like local changes or more short-term changes that are still happening and kind of up in the air that are still relevant to uh, be looking into and thinking about just kind of like yeah talking about the other questions that are uh, involved with glacier evolution yeah no I mean I think that makes sense um, and yeah I mean I think glaciers are one of those topics that really lend themselves well to even just you know, the wonder aspect, it's kind of like, you know, yeah. you start visually in your, you know, visualizing in your head like this, you know, tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago, you know, how different the earth was. And, you know, I think that, yeah, I think it makes sense to focus on that. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard with some of this stuff because, you know, a lot of times what we have to say is is really sad and bad news um which yeah and it also you know you're you know when we when we do this abt course you know kind of the the phrase that you keep hearing over and over again is you know what are the stakes you got to set the stakes what are the stakes and like you know as scientists on the ground working in this situation, you know what the stakes are probably better than anyone and it weighs heavily on you. And so I think that can kind of push you into that, like, no, the conversation needs to happen here. It's really urgent. And rather than, you know, trying to come back down and just kind of appreciate where we are today, live in the now, they're still here. Let's talk about how cool they are. Um, yeah. Um, Let's see, I see a question in the chat. Um, let's see. What if you assume common ground with someone but then learn there isn't actually anywhere you thought? Okay, um, where do you go from there? So, you know, depending on what the particular topic is, um, you know, there's, a, like I'm thinking of, um, showing my Notre Dame roots here. There's a researcher at Notre Dame that's um, very into water quality and, you know, obviously agriculture is like number one, like the enemy for anybody who does freshwater water quality, but she's out there working with the farmers to maximize their yields um, and also reduce nutrient input. So there are ways in which, you know, the scientists and the producers can work together. Um, so maybe even finding examples like that and saying, you know, hey, you know, there, did you hear about what they're doing, you know, in the next state over, there was this great, you know, pilot demonstration where they showed if you do, you know, whatever the environmentally friendly thing is, 
you actually do maximize your profit. Um, you know, or if there are, you know, again, from the waterfowl days, you know, the conservation reserve program was a big thing um, where I was at in North Dakota and, you know, talking about, you know, the farmers loved it. They were like, no, I don't have to work this land. I'm doing something good for the land. You know, we're, we're keeping our sediment, you know, and, you know, trying to, you know, dig down and say, okay, they, they care about their profits, but, you know, where, what is it that I care about that will also help maximize their profits? Um, trying to find a way, yes. Trying to find a way in which there's alignment um, or also showing them that, you know, there might be a different way to do their business. So, you know, if, if they're really stuck on doing business a certain way because they think that's the only way to maximize profit, if you can show them, you know, other examples, um, then I think that works out well. They don't always exist. None of this stuff is perfect. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, the, the thing too with this kind of, you know, these difficult conversations is you kind of have to have an arsenal of, you know, options in terms of how you can approach the problem and work together. And, you know, it's not going to work, you know, in every scenario, you may not have the, the perfect solution, or you just may not be able to come to agreement with some people. Um, you know, it's, it's never going to be 100%. But the more approaches and, um, you know, ideas that you have in terms of, you know, understanding the audience and the more you know about them and their values, the better. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I know we're, we're coming up on the end. Did, um, Adrian. Any? Yeah. Before we go, this is Jill. I don't know if you saw it in the chat earlier, but I was wondering if you could just briefly, I know it's hard, but just like talk about the definition of what science communication is. Cause it's something that I'm obviously gaining an interest in, but I feel mm -hmm. like I'm missing the foundation on the basics. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I see that now. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> it's one of those things, the definition is gonna change depending on who you talk to. Some people think of SciComm as like Twitter. Other people think of SciComm as, you know, giving Hill briefings. Um, actually, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. I gave a presentation um, actually right before coronavirus hit on 20 years of SciComm at the Ocean Sciences meeting. And, you know, one of the, um, can I share a screen? I can, oh no, I can't. Um, uh, can I have screen sharing? Thank you. Um, and just quickly, um, you know, I went through, so, you know, SciComm, you know, we used to think, oh, it's like, you know, talking to this audience. And, you know, I wanted to take an ecosystem approach. I'm a food web person. Say, you know what, there are all kinds of feedbacks between these groups. There's nonlinear interactions, like there's different strengths of interactions, like, you know, if you're trying to influence. So, you know, to me, science communication is trying to get science out into the universe where it can be used. Um, you know, I like to say making science matter. Um, that was like a big motivating goal of mine was like, you know, and now it's, you know, publications are on the internet and there's open access and people can, you know, get access, the public can, but, you know, just because they can download the PDF, do they have any context for what that means? Do they have any idea what half of the things in there means? Like, and if they're pulling things, we saw this with COVID, people pulling preprints off and saying, oh, there was a study and it's like, no, some Joe just uploaded this. It hasn't been peer reviewed, you know? So to me, science communication are the many ways in which someone takes, you know, a product of research and gets it useful for society. I don't know if that helps. It does. And by useful, okay. does that also mean just like general knowledge. So for example, a main thing that I'm doing here is the science and inventory monitoring network for the North Coast and Cascades region has 12 vital sign protocols and they're interested in partnering with the national parks within the network via social media to talk about their data. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that sounds like science communication to me, right? Yes. <laughs> they're using yeah. it for knowledge. 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And that, I mean, that goes back. I know I keep doing this with my hands, but like, you know, we t also tend to think of science communication as like, you know, oh my God, the, the West is burning. We need to go out there and, you know, have a serious conversation about, you know, water usage and, you know, everything else going on in the West and climate change and, oh my God, oh my God, you know, whereas you can also just communicate science just to communicate science, like just telling people, you know, hey, you know, there's this cool like new snail that we discovered. Do you want to hear about it? Or, you know, look at this underwater creature that changes colors, you know, based on, you know, the temperature, you know, just random stuff. Like, and that's, you know, that too is part of, you know, it's some of the foundational work of getting us as a society to where people trust scientists. If we're not always coming at them with something super contentious, that's threatening their lifestyle or making them feel like they're the bad guy, you know, think of the, the guy with the trucks, the love of the trucks, you know, if they're not always hearing something bad or that, you know, hearing scientists say you're bad, you're evil, you're destroying the world, they, you know, if they hear fun stuff and we can, you know, share joy in something together, then they're more likely to have those harder conversations and listen to us. Adrian, can I chime in for a sec? Yes, Thank please. You. Yeah. So Jill, this is an interesting question and I love Adrian's answer here. Um, I will say I've done a couple of my own science communication webinars, so it's so, so nice to see somebody else doing them. <laughs> um, but one of the first things that I usually do is I, I ask people to talk about what they think communication is. And I basically just cross out the word science um, because in order for you to have a solid understanding of science communication, you have to have a solid understanding of your own communication capabilities and why we communicate and what happens when there's poor communication. Specifically, if you think about, if you ever had a relationship with somebody and you didn't communicate your feelings accurately, you know, how those feelings were misinterpreted and, and, and always finding the commonality and starting, starting your communication with a, like the best intentions and knowing that you want the, the, the thing that you're trying to commute, communicate to get across and you know you have to approach it in such a way, especially if you're in a partner relationship where you know the partner is not going to listen to you unless you present it in such a way. And if you know that you have to do that in your daily life, and then you now you reapply that science word back into your communication strategy, then all of a sudden it starts to click that you have to put a little bit more mental effort into it. And it can't just be because you're in love with the idea of what you're doing. You have to make it you have to sell it to people and it's not easy to do right so that's um and that's why there's this whole science of science communication on how you do it but yeah so that's just a little spin off on you know think really thinking about the way you communicate successfully right, routinely and then how you can apply that to your science communication thanks are there any other uh, I know we're a few minutes over. I may have missed some stuff in chat. Any burning questions? Um, I'm going to, meanwhile, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Feel free to contact me. Um, oh, I lost the chat. Anything right. else? Jesse? Awesome. I was going to say if there's no more questions, um, I just want to let you know that when you exit, there'll be an exit survey. And if you could please take it, it really helps us know if these uh, workshops and webinars are doing anything for you guys. So we love your feedback. And you guys were awesome. You had some great ABTs and some great questions today. Great. Thank you all for participating. Enjoy Thanks. learning about your work. Thanks to you, Adrian, for coming. Yep. And teaching us all you know about science communication. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> a, a little Maybe bit. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone.